Oh, we are on air. Hey. Yep. We are. Hey, everybody. How's it going? Dan here with... Steven Schinder. And uh, uh, we both have the same last name because we're father and son. That's right. I'm the dad, in case you couldn't tell. Um, I know. I look so young, right? And speaking <laughs> of young and young at heart, uh, we're celebrating a very special person's birthday, Steve Howe. The guitarist for yes one of a few but the longest standing and most legendary with all due respect and one of the most legendary guitar players ever of any genre of music happy 77th yeah like each yes guitarist i consider legendary but i think if you're talking yeah. like in the prog rock sphere steve howe has had a lot of contributions there like with asia as well and um you could even throw in well i guess gtr like has some of that 80s sound in it so sure um but yeah quite a lot of contributions so on this episode we decided to talk about a couple of things and pardon us if we go like all over the place there's just like some really interesting stuff but we're talking about Steve Howe's autobiography, All My Yesterdays, as well as uh, what we think of the Tomorrow release, Permanent Dream, which came out almost a year ago. And it was a 2023 remaster of Tomorrow's self-titled album from 1968. So um, did you want to start with that uh, first question we have there? On yeah. Our and the autobiography yeah which is uh just wonderful so i'll ask you first what was your biggest overall takeaway and did you read it and listen to the audio i only listened to the audible version right so time. i i read the ebook version about two years ago and in preparation for this i kind of flipped through it again but i also listened to this one hour preview of the book that i think it's from google play or something it's um mm. so um and yeah i don't so that's my experience with it and like you said you've only listened to the audiobook version narrated by simon vance um and we'll get to simon but in the meantime what's your biggest overall takeaway from this autobiography so I think my biggest takeaway is that, you know, despite how the relationships with various people are, like with Steve Howe and like other people, he he's still willing to give them credit where credit is due in terms of their contributions to music and all the work that they put in. And so uh, I think that's really important because it shows that, there's not like um like he doesn't like sugarcoat things but he does give credit where credit is due is that, if that makes sense i don't know if he knows who the sugar is <laughs> but and what i mean is that and that does make sense because my biggest takeaway is similar and that is that this there's a lot of truths in here that some people may be surprised by um but as Steve said, uh, Steve Howe does give credit where credit's due and all of this, but there were some, some conflicting personal issues with certain people and certain behaviors. And, and I was a little surprised that it was that transparent and, and revealing, and I don't take issue with it. It almost really kind of made the read, or in my case, listen, more real and more you know, I'm grateful that he was that honest about things, but um, that's that's one of probably my biggest one is just how much truth was in it that even hardcore fans would probably be unaware of because it's stuff that, to my knowledge, has not been published elsewhere. Right. Yeah. Like there are some things that people might be like, "Whoa, if that happened," and but. Yeah. yeah, I think it does give it a more balanced view, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so Simon, 
um, I'm sorry, what's his last name? The the narrator. Simon Vance. Yeah, Simon Vance. I thought he did a great job. And, you know, for the first little while, I was a, a little disappointed because I would want to hear it in Steve's voice. I love listening to autobiographies in the author's voice. But I also understand, I think you and I talked about this a few days ago, different reasons why people might not do it. The sake of time, uh, they just don't want to sit and record. They're not good at reading out loud. I'm not. Um, bringing back all, you know, the flood of emotions and stuff. I mean, when you write something like this, um, and as you know, I've written something that won't come out for a while, but I don't know if I'd want to read it out loud. I might have someone else there. I don't know. But so I can kind of relate to that. You just poured your life out for however long it took to write his book and then to sit and read it. It's like, I get that, you know? So then I started to become very fond of uh, Simon's voice because the more I thought about it, the more he had a similar cadence to Steve Howe's voice. You know, it's not like like if you got me to read it, bouncing off the walls and bleh, it just wouldn't make sense. And a, a voiceover artist like that, but Simon just kind of plugged in with a similar demeanor and voice cadence, and and I liked it. You know, if it was someone with a Southern Georgia accent from America, it wouldn't make sense. You know, if it was someone with a heavy Australian accent, it wouldn't make sense. So I, I think it's a really great choice. I'm not familiar with any other work. He might be a very famous actor or voiceover artist for all I know. I don't, I'm unaware. How about you? Yeah, from the preview I listened to, um, I really enjoyed how he was reading it. I don't think I was comparing it to how Steve sounds. Um so I'd be curious if maybe that varies from person to person, but I think he did a good job like reading it clearly. And I can see why he gets like audio book work. Like he's really good at narrating this stuff. Cool. Yeah. Do you so know if he's done other audio book work? Uh, yeah, but don't ask me what titles. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> nice preempt. <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> And so the structure of his auto, but uh, I keep wanting to say audio biography, autobiography is it pretty much goes up to mid 2017. And then it came out in 2020. Um, and it actually begins with the rock and roll hall of fame stuff. And I think that's pretty smart to begin with that. Cause it's, it's something that we've been taught in, writing classes you know back back when i was in college especially in journalism like you gotta begin with a scene that's really gripping and hook people in and then you can go back in time and start from the beginning so uh i, I think the sort of chaoticness of the rock and roll hall of fame stuff was an interesting place to start before you go way back in time from when he was really young because like, I'm not sure how um, it would have played off if he had just started, like, right from the beginning, you know? No, I, I agree. It's also something that I learned in um, professional public speaking, the same thing. You don't just yeah. walk on stage and say, hi, thank you. I want to thank Kathy, the event plan. you you got to grip them right from the beginning. The interesting thing about the choice of that is – the two elements, one, they finally got in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Like that's a big moment for the legacy of the band, right? To finally get in. But then the the backstory, the behind the curtain story and the follies and the antics and the, you know, all the, the displeasure of some stuff and different things and Tony not being, all those things just added that much more to that element of starting with that, right? Yeah. And some of the stuff we kind of already knew beforehand, um, like the order in which people spoke should have been different and maybe there would have been a better outcome. But yeah. Yeah. Like it was a huge moment for the band, but also like a really belated moment. Like ideally they would have been inducted in like the mid nineties or something. And so maybe everyone could have been there, but yeah, it is what it is. Yeah. And I feel like between this and uh, Getty Lee's book, um, 
my effing life, as well as what Billy has said about like that time, we kind of get a good overview of what that event was like, these different perspectives. Yeah, it rounds out the what our perceived reality of it, uh, rather than just hearing one version of it, you know? Right. And uh, Steve does talk a bit about his childhood. I think he even mentions playing with uh, toy soldiers, if I remember correctly. Yeah. So, you know, we've talked before. That's something that me and my brother, Alex, um, have, you know, your other son, have oh, yeah. played with when we were little kids. And it's just kind of funny, like, imagining Steve Howe, like, being that young and playing those but it is but well. i have to throw a couple of things in and hi guys we'll get to comments in a moment feel free to chime in folks if you've read the book or if you have a steve house story go ahead and pop it in there uh but the way you played with the little toy soldiers was different from anyone else and that was using them to act out the entire movie of monty python the holy grail oh yeah there's and, even a monty python mention in this book funny enough. yeah yeah and that was that was neat a couple times um so yeah just a quick shout out a couple people chiming in john Papalardo, who actually lives about 12 minutes from me uh says hi guys hey john thanks for chiming in larry elbertson a longtime drum talk tv fan and yes shift fan hi guys it's lunch break just wanted to pop in and say hi thank you so why are we also simulcasting this on drum talk tv well we do most if not all our episodes on yes shift simulcast it over to drum talk tv because one we're both a big part of drum talk tv but the other is in this specific case um steve howe is a huge huge influence on me musically um in so many ways not just as a guitar player playing guitar and other stringed instruments which i just love stringed instruments i've never studied them very deeply but i have a few and I, I like him, I also love older instruments. I love the instruments of the Renaissance period and of different cultures and, and whatnot. Um, and being the co-creator and creator himself of so much great music that I love personally and love playing too throughout the Yes catalog, um, his solo career, especially the first two albums for me and also Asia. Um, it makes sense, at least to me, and hopefully it will to others that we're simulcasting this on Jump Talk TV. You know, the same way that like when it's Rick Wakeman or Keith Emerson's birthdays, I, I do a drum thing on Drum Talk TV and play to some of their songs and stuff. So so I just wanted to kind of, in case people are watching going, what? You know, that just don't know. So there you go. Right. And also like his lyrical contributions. Oh, yeah. We contributed to some of the yes lyrics and it can't be understated you know yeah um yeah his his pre yes stuff you know you mentioned as a, a little kid and then getting into you know a young man it's like wow some of that stuff like the way he acquired his most cherished guitars yes 175 um and started playing with other people you know the way that unfolded uh was really cool but i have to say as a lover of instruments, and I'll tell a little story I told Enja, my, that's my wife for those who don't know, the other night when we were listening to part of the book together. Um, I love how Steve Howe really goes into the, he's a detail guy, you know, he's yeah. real meticulous. I love how he goes into the gear because I love instruments, not just drums, but I love instruments. And with guitars and stuff, I'm actually very knowledgeable about guitars and amps not just because of a personal interest, but when I was like 16, 17, 18, around there throughout the period, I worked at the music store that I grew up buying from and where I first took lessons when I was like just before seven years old. Uh, it's called Kay's Music Scene, and it was founded and owned by um, Sidney Kay, who happened to be, amongst others, Danny Kay's drummer. No relation, though. And... Um, when I worked there as a teenager, one of my jobs was to, one at a time, take every stringed instrument off the wall, take it into the luthier's booth, polish it, put oil on the rosewood or whatever kind of fretboard it was, change the strings if it had been demoed a lot, and and do uh, set the intonation with an oscilloscope. I mean, I was like really into it. It really 
helped me fall in love with the craftsmanship that goes into these instruments. So when he's talking about how he he changed this with that and or got this cherished thing or got this one for that tone, all these little, little things, I really dig that stuff. Yeah, for sure. And so he does go into the Prius band days, you know, the bands he was in prior to Yes. Yeah. And like we mentioned, you know, one of them was Tomorrow. And so that kind of brings us to this Tomorrow album. And yeah. And before we do that, I, I do want to just mention that I learned more about Bodas and Tomorrow from his book than I had ever heard oh, yeah. or read in any other music magazine or for interviews or anything. It was, it was pretty rich with some early history about his whole career and, yeah. and just and the music business. Cats. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So you want to talk about Tamara? Yeah, so we're talking about yesterday's and tomorrow, basically. Right. Um, so yeah, this Tomorrow album, uh, well, their self-titled album was recorded in 67, released in 68. And for this remaster from last year, uh, it has a different cover. The cover is actually kind of big generator. As yeah. Version. Like what's with that? We've mentioned that before, <laughs> I think when it first came out, but the, and I'm sorry, folks, the, the thing that we're using, the platform we're using, won't let me size this. So it fits all the way in. We got to figure that out. I just can't make it smaller. Um, but, but yeah, the cover was quite surprising to me. I mean, the stretched out letters you know that font and just the colors alone um interesting yeah, pink and yellow yeah yeah um and so for this remaster it, it looks like a few songs were swapped out i think colonel brown shy boy and auntie mary's dress shop i believe um and i read somewhere that steve said that those were kind of filler songs and so for the songs that are included on the on this particular remaster uh he basically did some like refining and making things in tune i think a couple tracks are shorter um one of them had narration at the beginning previously and i can kind of see why that would be cut out just to get straight to the point um and i think the live tracks on this might be on the physical release i'm not sure if they're like on streaming mm. but um yeah what what do you think of the style of this music that they he used um post production to sort of like uh refine it a bit for today um i think as in some cases or in some cases when you modernize something it does exactly that and it loses its time capsuleness which i love you know, if, if something was recorded on a four track machine with dusty tape and it's scratchy, but that music made it to vinyl and made it to the radio, I say leave it like that. This did not lose any of that. Like I had it playing on my phone for a bit and I went out in the other room and I told my wife, I said, Angie, don't let me eat the brown acid. And she's like, what? And I just <laughs> held this up. I said, the music is like taking me just no, no matter how much I ask for it, don't let me eat it. It, it really threw me back. And I don't listen to music from way back then often at all. And if I do, uh, believe it or not, folks, it's not the Beatles. It's not, um, uh, Jefferson Airplane. It's not. It's either really old Pink Floyd or really old Jethro Tull. And this reminded me of that era and why I do like to listen to that from time to time. And in fact, that first, uh, or not the first song, but My White Bat Bicycle did remind me of that song, the Pink Floyd song called, it's a Sid Barrett era. Well, do you know the name of the song I'm thinking of? It has Bicycle in the title. Oh, uh, um... Steve will look it up while I continue, but the the album in today's music that is flooded with so much of quote today's music. Okay, it's just called bike. Bike. Okay, yeah, that's right. It <laughs> kind of reminded me of that, not as if it was emulating it, but just that same theme, the the sound. Um, it was cool because uh, in the, you know today's world we get flooded with so much of today's music that to hear a time capsule 
release like this from back then was very refreshing. And if we really listen, you know, we should be aware when we listen to music, especially as musicians, it you can hear where other music you're fond of came from. And of course, you know, automatically, I think like most people, I'm sure like you, Steve, I listened to it going, okay, where are influences and in yes, in Asia and his solo stuff that I can hear the early seeds of. And, and honestly, at first there weren't a lot to my ears because maybe I was looking for specific things, mm -hmm. but what I did like my two favorite songs are why and revolution revolution i think might be the most progressive song on the album to my ears anyways more parts changes instruments you know things like that and why i just liked the groove of it and his soloing and you know all that all that stuff is when i kind of heard like okay i can i can hear some fender type instruments there uh, a bit of runs like in uh, a parallels and you know some little things come through but well how about you did you yeah. did you listen to it with those ears as well trying to pick out early steve how recognizable things that were brought forward in time yeah what's funny is uh you mentioned why and that's a cover of a bird's song oh really i didn't even know because i don't really listen to bands of that era yeah and uh what's funny is i think yes also covered uh bird song i think it might have been i see you so right there you see, so right there you see that yes members uh even when they weren't performing together quite yet still had some of the same influences and steve mentions in his book that uh the tomorrow song revolution may have influenced the beatles song of the same name yeah um he even mentions like recording in abbey road studios and paul and ringo would pop in sometimes that's right and, and so when imagine that way back up a minute imagine that for a moment you're a young musician. people yeah <laughs> in <laughs> can you imagine oh, you're a yeah. young musician one of your first bands that actually gets a deal and even back then the legacy of the beatles is like you know bright and shiny and here they are popping in like that's just crazy yeah and um what was i gonna say uh my favorite song on this is my white bicycle uh, and when listening to this album i could definitely hear you know whether the influences were there or not it felt to me like that psychedelic slash classic 60s rock era so i was yeah. thinking of bands like the beatles the stones the who and uh, i i also heard traces of maybe a similar style to what would end up on yes's cover of america and steve even oh. mentions in his book that in the in 1992 he got to meet paul simon and paul simon said that he likes the yes version of america so that yeah, must him really him on his guitar him. work yeah yeah all that so, extended stuff yeah yeah, so those were some of the influences and similarities that I kind of picked on, um, picked up on when listening to this album. And I, I think it, like you said, it's a, it is a really good time capsule of that era. Um, yeah, yeah, you know, I don't think there was too much changing of some of the stuff. You know, like the track list was changed a bit, and I mentioned like the other stuff earlier but I, I think it summarizes the band really well and uh, of course that band also consisted of keith west on vocals junior wood on bass john alder on drums and from what i read the surviving members of tomorrow like this had their stamp of approval mm. so which is really cool and yeah i think it's a nice release to like have out there uh, i know last year like um we kind of i i think we were thinking of talking about this but there were like other things we had scheduled for the show that had priority you know people we were having on and some anniversaries and stuff so but i, I think it's cool that we we're able to give that release it's due now almost a year later so yeah is there anything else you want to say about that album before we talk a bit more? Well, uh, well, 
Only that I, again, loved the preservation of the sound of the era. And it was really enjoyable to hear that such an early Steve Howe, you know, and then thinking of all the music along the way up until now. Um, it's interesting to hear those roots and enjoy them. I yeah. like it. Do you think it might have been more popular? Like, do you think Tamar might have been more popular if they'd released their album a couple years earlier? Because when I was listening to it, I was thinking to myself, I can't imagine these songs being on the radio and not being a big hit, you know? So when you say a couple years... In the mid-60s. Oh, so I thought you meant this uh, this latest re-release of oh it. no i mean when oh yeah i was thinking like what difference would that make <laughs> like in the mid 60s as opposed to the late 60s i you? do i think had it had i and i don't know if you know that was possible but had that music come out in the mid 60s like 65 ish 66 and i know that doesn't sound like a lot of time difference people but music pop music and rock and all that really did evolve a lot between 1960 and 1969 is like there's there's several generations of musical evolution during that time so it's a fair question when you put it that way um back then yeah I, i'd say maybe but yet i don't want that to minimize the impact it did have when it did come out you know if that makes sense but what do you think are you asking because you believe had it come out a little earlier it may have been more successful. It may have fit in yeah. with what was happening then. Yeah, I think so. And I think even members of the band have said as much. So I can see where they're coming mm. from. Um, so, and I don't think it means they were late to the party. You know, like, oh, they put something that's outdated because it came out two years later. I don't think that. Right. Yeah, like, it's definitely great that they were able to make this stuff. And I'm glad that it got... <laughs> another day in the spotlight with the recent re-release um so oh i see we got a comment from adam parish who says hey guys i bought steve's book when it came out and really enjoyed it something to read during lockdown yeah it came out during lockdown i think that might have also been when steve hackett's book a uh, genesis on my bed came out mm. now i embarrassingly i don't have the hard copy is it full of a lot of photos and stuff yeah, there are some photos. I, I do remember one of them showed Steve Howe with some Muppets, which is kind of funny. So that sounds um, familiar. What was that occasion? Yeah. And, and that was in the and that was in the ebook version. So it's in there, and it's got to be in like the physical copy as well. I imagine. But what was the occasion? Was he on Sesame Street or something? Um, I think he might have been. Like, I'd have to like look for it and find it but um i have to like swipe through well you do it. that i want to mention one other thing that was interesting there was a lot of stuff i never knew or heard and one of the things was when he mentioned uh sitting at the table with eric clapton jeff beck and david gilmore for that uh party that was thrown for I think one of the Fender guitar creators or something. Do you remember that part, Steve? Um, sounds familiar. Yeah, I, that was neat. You know, just him sharing some special moments that were special to him um, was really cool. Oh, and, you know, going through, especially like the last 10 years of his career as this was written, um, he's one of the absolute busiest musicians ever. You know, he's in the two bands he's doing. Then he's got his own band, the trio. Then he's got his solo work. And he's just bouncing from one thing to another with seemingly very little time off in between. Just like, wow. He would, I don't know if as much as I loved playing live and touring, us, I don't know if I could handle that now. Yeah. And he also mentioned uh, playing with Jimi Hendrix. Like, yeah, you're, that you're was surprised by that crazy. too. Crazy. Right? Yeah, that yeah. was nuts. How many even legendary guitar players can say they did that? Right. Okay. And he so, was reluctant, right? And Jimmy signaled him to come on stage. Uh, yeah, that sounds familiar. Yeah. yeah, it's. I think it's in like the fourth chapter of the book or something, or yeah, so, somewhere around there. And 
I quite like how the chapter titles are named after songs and maybe lyrics in some places. I yeah. think that's a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, so there are photos from like his youth and early bands and later bands and the Muppets thing. Uh, he was invited to watch a filming of the Muppets in 1980. So oh, there's wow. a picture of him with the newsman. Ha! Huh. Funny. Yeah. Something. So, oh, go what? ahead. <laughs> oh, slug bug. Um, Annie Haslin, when we interviewed her, and I love that he called her up in his book so many times, but she told us one of the things she said about him was what a gentleman he was and everything. And I really, really got an overwhelming sense of that listening mm -hmm. to the, the audio version of the book that it really was. And that's also the side of him, I believe, that made him so meticulous and fastidious about things and so by the book and strict when it came to performing and all those things I think are folded into that man that she was referring to, you know, just like the ultimate consummate professional musician. Yeah. And was there anything in the book that surprised you that we haven't mentioned yet? Yeah. Um, his early drug use, <laughs> to tell you the truth, when he was so open about in the really early days, and I forgot what band he was in. It might have been uh, Bodas or Tomorrow, or even before those. That you know, he mentioned the heavy drinking and then all the hash. And the, I'm like, Steve, how? Like it was just so. But then, when things started to flip for him and continued and has throughout his life in 1972 when him and Jan became vegetarians and they be, got into microbiotic, which I knew about years and years ago, but then even still today, you know, the things he talks about that he studies in regard to Taoism, Zen, meditation, you know, all these different things that affect your mind, your physical body and your spiritual, your soul, you know, all that stuff I really loved. And there were some things that were a little bit surprising from the earlier days because I know him more as the, the now persona versus the, you know, they'd get so yeah, ripped like, that they like barely... A straight laced <laughs> proper behavior yeah. persona yeah how about you what kind of surprise there must have been some yeah i was kind of surprised that you know even just his first solo album beginnings that there wasn't as much coverage like in-depth coverage of that or of the making of certain songs and it kind of similar to how i felt reading Steve Hackett's book. You know, I really enjoyed that book as well, but it was kind of surprising how he didn't delve into his solo career, the making of certain things, all that much. But so with um with uh, all my yesterdays, I kind of had to remind myself that okay, this is a career and of decades long career. And it's a lot to summarize in a book. So I think just taking that into account, you know, the medium, like it still does its yeah. job of encapsulating the career. And, you yeah. know, Steve Howe and Steve Hackett, they each have their things that they'd like to talk about. And if they feel like they've put down what they want to say in the way that they want to say it, then that that's respectable, you know? Yeah, I I had forgotten about this, but was surprised at first that he doesn't even play on Relayer. That was like, pff, I completely forgot about that. Wait, what? Oh, what? Oh, this isn't April Fool's Day anymore. <laughs> yeah, no, but but you reminded me. It was um, you know, I don't want to talk about dwell on this too much, but okay. in in the book when he says, uh, you know, because he was writing this in the 2010s, and he was like. Uh, we're we're hoping to perform Sound Chaser and to be over again in the future and just having the hindsight of the changed plans. But yeah, yeah it was like a big oof moment reading that yeah. part. A prophetic, but, um, maybe. <laughs> but um, I do like the detail he goes into, even with ABWH and symphonic music of Yes. And yeah, that was it. Oh, oh, that was surprising when he said that that no one was happy with the cover of magnification that really took me aback like for it to not be roger dean is okay there's been other ones that weren't roger dean
but I thought for it to not be Roger Dean, that was a great cover. And he said no, but yeah. at John Anderson's insistence, it wasn't going to be, and they got that, and no one was happy with it. That surprised me because I love that cover. Yeah, I think the magnification cover fits with the, you know, list, hearing the title of that album and seeing that cover, it just somehow makes sense to me, you know? Yeah. Uh, a couple other quick things. When he mentioned that the DVD that they filmed in Amster Amsterdam, he thinks is possibly the best DVD, the best Yes film. And I had to really yeah. think about that. Like, I love that. But I think what makes songs from Songus better for me is the fact that there's a keyboard member in the band. No offense to our friend Tom Brislin at all. It's a wonderful performance by everybody. It's a wonderful DVD. Hearing the stories of the different orchestras and how some worked better than others and all of that. But but songs from Songas being the five of them that are all members, for me, it was just one step above. Cinematographically, I do think maybe symphonic is better that there's some that's yeah. wonderfully filmed and edited. Yeah. At some point we do need to cover those 21st century films. Yeah. Still. But, um, we will yeah, fold on the old ones. Songs from Songas is, um, my favorite as well, but I think symphonic live is also a favorite of John Anderson. If I remember correctly, oh, like he's talked about revisiting, uh, like watching that again in recent years. Um, and why so, doesn't that have a Roger Dean cover? <laughs> why does it have the crop circles and stuff? I never understood that. Yeah, I, I think that that theme fits very well with, uh, you know, flowing from the magnification cover okay. you know, on the back like of the it. Other side of the story. Yeah, you know, Everyone. you got this planet and like the John Anderson symbol thing, this device or. What, yeah. whatever it is uh, i think it fits well with that theme okay um cool. but yeah and steve does talk a bit about family you know whatever he's comfortable with uh, i'm sure like you know he mentions that they all miss virgil and it's understandable that um there wouldn't be too much time spent because it's like tough to talk about but Oh. I do like that he talks about the family at least. Yeah, and I was surprised that he mentioned it up front. And then he didn't mention it later in the chronology of when it happened. But I did like that he spent the time talking about the album Nexus that they did together. And yeah, is our um, anthology. Yeah, for sure. Um, yeah, so this was a really good read, you know, with these. Absolutely. Good, great these. listen, too. Yeah, you know, with these autobiographies that uh, we've talked about, you get different things. Um, like in Phil Collins' book, Not Dead Yet, you learn a bit about some of the stuff he went through. and Goodness, um, yes. Yeah, and what's funny is with, like, the familiar events, um, I get so tuned in to, like, you know, the big events and the careers of these bands and these musicians. So, like, with Phil Collins' book, for example... Uh, when they're trying to figure out what singer should replace Peter Gabriel. It's like we as the audience know what's going to happen, but it's like, okay, how long is it going to take for them to figure out when you're like reading this? And thing? what are the steps? Yeah, it was, there was a few things. I think what you're saying also in Steve Howe's book, All My Yesterday, yeah. there were a few things like that, like when Rick left and they got Patrick and then Patrick sort of went to outer space and they got Rick back and then with Igor and then with the, Jeff and with it just back and forth and Oliver and the, it, that was like a constant thread because that's part of, yes, you know? Um, so to, so like you say, we know the outcome, but hearing and reading the behind the scenes elements of how each thing fell apart or came back together was quite interesting. I liked that. Yeah. He very much acknowledges that yes, has had such a complex evolution with all the people coming in and out of the band. Yeah. Um, so it really does its job of adding and like shedding light on some of the mythology of the band, if you want to call it that. Yeah, it might be the most thorough account of it so far. Oh, you really think so? I do, because there's a lot of stuff in it I haven't heard in interviews. There's a lot of stuff I've never read in magazines from back in the day, like Cream, Hit Parade, that kind of stuff. and 
And like you said earlier, we see the other side of some of the other stories by some of the other people involved. There's just so much more depth to it all that, yeah, I do think this might be the richest account of all the behind the scenes stuff of how things came together from one album and tour to the next with not just yes, but with Asia as well. Yeah. I never realized he was so busy with the Steve Howe trio and that him and Dylan did so much work together. Yeah. And I, I think between, um, you know, both Steve's, you also get a good um, overview of the GTR situation as well. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. We highly recommend folks. We give it 10 stars out of five. <laughs> it, it was really, truly a, a, a gem. It was great. Yeah. And uh, before I forget, I want to give a shout out to something I saw earlier. There's this video up on YouTube called Steve Howe Knows I Have His Old Guitar. And it's basically a phone call uh, that this person who bought Steve Howe's guitar from someone um, had with him. So, And the guitar looks really nice. It's a really cool looking Les Paul. Apparently, Steve would like uh, put an invisible signature on oh. the back of it and it's a really cool conversation and it even mentions uh, uh the tomato story book by our friend kevin from yes oh. music podcast so, and where is this uh this is up on youtube it's called okay Steve send me that i'd love to check that out all right or pop yeah. it in pop it into the comments as well all right saying yeah, what I'm it is since you brought it up you might as well share with the rest of the class <laughs> <laughs> Okay, right. so I have to ask this question. Since it's Steve Howe's birthday, and this is for all of you watching, whether you're watching live or on the archive, whether you're watching on Yes Shift or Drum Talk TV, what is your favorite work by Steve Howe? It could be a song. It could be a specific passage or solo. It could be an entire album. It could be an entire era. But if you had to pick any one of those choices to express a favorite, starting with my son, Steven, what would it be? It's, and you can't say all of yes. Like the whole <laughs> time in yes. Like that's a okay. little too far. So yeah. it can't be all the yesterdays. Okay. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, this is probably no surprise, but I would say Tales from Topographic Oceans. You know, it's my favorite yes album. And it's got some really great guitar work on there and some great lyrics. Um, like, I don't know. I can't, I can't really think of anything else that tops that for me as great as his discography is what about you that i have to agree i wasn't sure i was settled on something when i asked the question but as soon as you answered you know that is my favorite album oh so you're gonna all. steal my answer what's that <laughs> what I, I said you're gonna steal my answer I oh <laughs> no but it's the same it is my right. favorite all-time album and and you know i i would love this is so selfish. I don't care to hear anyone else's remix of that, but I would love to personally remix it mm. because I, I hear in my head how to modernize it without losing what's there. Like I mentioned about the tomorrow album, because okay. it's so easy to do that. It's so easy to take everything and just make it brighter and bigger and fatter and deeper. And, and that's not always what something needs, you know, and there's so many little subtleties like a Monty Python film, there's so many subtleties in that album that 50 years later, whatever, I listen to it and I go, oh my gosh, I never noticed that little string pull off right there. Or, you know, I love stuff like that. And I think some of that would shine through with a slightly different mix. I say slightly because I wouldn't plan on ruining it by making it my own but just enhance certain enhancements and, and with what sonically is possible today, that's an album that's worthy of that. And even if you listen to that and then the sonic properties of Relayer, they are quite different. It Relayer does make tails sound a bit like pushed down a bit, if you will, or squashed to a degree with the same analogy of the way drama is to Tormato, Relayer is to Tails sonically, mm -hmm. but the music on Tails prevails. That should be a book. Like to, it rises way above that because back then that's all there was anyway. You know, it sounded as it sounded. Now there's so many things to compare it to, which might not be fair, but it opens our ears 
and eyes to the possibilities of what could be done with it. And I'm just, like I said, I'm selfishly saying, I'm just afraid someone else would go overboard and do too much. Whereas I have a very clear um, sonic vision in my head of what I would do to it. That's just me. It sounds like a fun project. So yeah, I, I know that. The duplicates of the multi-tracks, Mr. Howe. <laughs> Yeah, I know that uh, Stephen Wilson has done a remix of Tales, but I'm not sure that I've ever listened. I'm on. Un see, I'm totally unaware. I didn't even know that. Yeah. Um, I'd be willing to listen to it. Maybe that's a show. Compare and do some side by side snippets. Oh, we can't do that. It'll get muted. <laughs> what an idiot! But right. <laughs> um, I, <laughs> I would love to cite side by side snippets without playing them and get other people involved you know fans to chime in on on that there's a couple more comments i think let me take a peek um oh that's you um i i just think the music is it, it's like if you had an amazing performance by the london philharmonic doing brahms and it was from 1960 it'd be an amazing challenge to get the 2024 london philharmonic to do the same performance as good, but with modern recording technology and pressing and all that. Um, that's the way I'm looking at it. Yeah, It's not that it sucks. I would just love to hear what could be done. So I, I wanna hear the Steve Wilson mix now, because I know that album inside and out, like every, almost every Yes album, except a couple of the real early ones. I, I know every note can play every note on most of the instruments, not nearly as well, but the drums I have down, I've been playing it since it came out basically yeah. so i'd love to hear i can my point is i'm not bragging that my point is i'd be able to hear the differences with the steve wilson mix in every little nuance because i know it so well that's all yeah and um you've also reminded me that kevin i think we might have mentioned this before he's working on a book called the tales from topographic oceans listening guide so oh yeah he did mention that yeah yeah so that'll yeah. be an interesting I, read as well sure for sure and i remembered something else from all my yesterdays when he started talking about the whole all the asia stuff it actually inspired me to go downstairs into my studio and play to some asia music like it oh, got yeah. me juiced up yeah it really did it was very inspirational hearing how it all came together and how they developed the songs and the sounds and the and i said i want to go play some of that and i played a few things off the first album yeah we do get some good asia coverage in this book um yeah again like this does a great job showing the different aspects of his career yeah Great job. Awesome. Thanks, folks, for following what we do and for joining Stephen and I on our review of All My Yesterdays by Steve Howe, his autobiography. It's available pretty much everywhere. Um, if you want the audio version, I got it on Audible. It's such a great listen. It's great. And I, I typically prefer to listen to books rather than read them for two reasons. One, I, I, it's hard for me to find time to read books. And two, it's hard for me to find time to read books. But the books that I, <laughs> that I do read as opposed to listen to are more like educational, instructional books. I can highlight them and stuff like that. So, so if you're like me and you like to listen, uh, this is a great one. Yeah, definitely. All right. So... Yeah, I'm sure there's probably some other anecdotes that will come back to mind and be like, oh, yeah, we didn't mention that. But that, that just shows how rich this book is. Like, Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's tough to, like, say every little thing that's, like, in it, but it's there's a lot about yeah. it that's worth reading. Cool. Thanks, folks. You can follow us at uh youtube.com <laughs> slash at yes shift you can follow us at facebook.com slash yes shift you can go to anchor.fm slash yes shift and you can write to us at yes shift podcast at gmail.com give us suggestions comments um and on drum talk tv where we simulcast yeah for sure all right thanks for tuning in everyone and we'll see you all soon Thanks.